Allison's overriding mission is to improve the way the world works. The Vehicle Environmental Test Center will allow Allison and its partners to complete year-round testing. Our customers and partners will be able to replicate extreme environments to solidify dependable, reliable, repeatable, and secure results all in one centralized location. Validate, develop, and bring new products to market faster. Their data is confidential, all of the information that they have. We have a cloud-based platform which further accelerates product development and get products to market more quickly. We're not relying on Mother Nature to deliver the right conditions for testing. It's hot soak and cold soak chambers, plus 125 Fahrenheit to a minus 54 Fahrenheit. Altitude testing down to sea level, up to 5,000 meters or 18,000 feet. Full road load simulation with two chassis dynamometer test cells inside the facility, a heavy duty and a medium duty. We have electrification capabilities up to 500 kilowatt at 600 volts of DC power. We can test electric vehicles, hybrids, emissions testing, performance, onboard diagnostics. Any variety of test options are limitless. A seasonally independent, repeatable, reliable test facility that lets us compress the product development time frame. It's like nothing you've ever seen. A remarkable achievement. Extreme condition. Repeatable. Reliable. One of a kind. Secure. Open for business. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Kristen Gicek. I'm the Senior Vice President at the Center for Automotive Research. And I'm happy to invite you and, and have you here for our forecasting panel. Um, it's often uh, the case that the forecasting panel, you know, we the people who run our conference who do a great job and our AV team, they like, could you have your slides in three weeks early? Forecasting is not like that. <laughs> And you know, we were looking at the Twitter feeds and looking at news the, all day the, today to t inform the uh, conversation we're going to have here with you today. So this is um, really fresh stuff, and I'm really glad you're here in person to see it. Um, we have a panel of three really great speakers. Uh, first, we're going to have Jeff Schuster. He's the president of Global Forecasting at LMC Automotive. He'll be followed by Stephanie Brinley, the Principal Automotive Analyst for North and South America and the Auto Intelligence Unit at IHS Market. And last, Colin Langen, uh, Director and Senior Equity and Al Analyst at Wells Fargo Securities, covering the auto and auto parts sector. So I'd like you to welcome our panel and we'll start off with Jeff. Thank you very much, Kristen, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think to follow up on, on some of your thoughts, uh, it certainly has turned into, from a forecasting standpoint, um, more real-time monitoring, uh, real-time forecasting, uh, where we're really focused on the short term, and then we're focused on the very long term, uh, whether that's electrification or AVs. Uh, so I think hopefully we'll, we'll bridge those two areas uh, during the, the session here today. So I'm going to take you through uh, kind of our view on where we see the outlook going. I'm going to focus on really two main areas. One, what's changed uh, really since the beginning of the year or as the years progressed uh, from an overall standpoint of the industry. Uh, focusing on, uh, we're going to talk about chips, sorry. Uh, we have to talk about chips, so we're going to do that. And then uh, a little bit of the view on electrification, some of the, the um, uh, regulatory environment, uh, obviously here in the U.S., but also globally. So I'm going to focus a lot of the, the conversation here on the globe and how the U.S. and North America fits into that perspective. Um, overall, though, when we first look and start at a very high level, I think um, you've got to start with the economies around the world and some of the areas that are driving the growth, uh, not only here, but in, in most of the auto markets. Um, certainly last year, recession, shortest rece recession, I think, on record in the U.S., I believe it was a three-month recession. So I think we're already potentially looking at a, at a mid-cycle at this point in 2021. So we might be past peak already. Um, 
We are looking for, uh, for a 7% growth rate that's been edging down over the last the few weeks though. So I, again, I think everything is, is green across, the, really across the globe from a green light perspective. Um, growth is, is very strong in, in all the major markets. So from an economic standpoint, the economy is there to support the auto sector, consumers are there to buy. The question is, are there vehicles and are there other issues going on preventing them from buying? So I think when you look at it from a year-to-date standpoint, and I pulled in our uh, year-to-date um, electric vehicle element as well, looking at global in the U.S. Uh, the U.S., we obviously have, uh, have seen the report of July as well, so I'll, I'll bring in that perspective. But this is the first half of the year. Uh, globally, you're looking at a selling rate that was around 84.5 million units, uh, so certainly better than it was a year ago, which was roughly uh, 66.7 uh, million units last year at this point in time. Uh, so, so definitely moving in the right direction. You see the industry's up about 21%. Similar numbers, uh, U.S. through June was outperforming. We had those two outrageous months of 18 and 18.8 million unit selling rates. Uh, that definitely benefited the industry. When you compare that and contrast it with where we are with the BEV uh, movement, uh, you certainly see very strong growth rates, uh, pushing over 170% globally, right about there for the U.S. So the U.S. is, is caught up in the sense of, of a year-over-year -year change in the BEV market, obviously not there from a volume or a share perspective yet. Looking at the world, though, uh, we're looking at a market uh, now that's about 86 million units, so it's 11% growth rate. If we were to track back a, a few months, uh, back in April, we've taken out about a million and a half units uh, for some of the restrictions in, in Asia as well as uh, the chip shortage. So that's been the major cause of it. You can see similar growth rates around the world, at least in North America, uh, rest of Asia, so Japan, Korea, Australia, India, South America, all in the double digits. It's uh, Europe that's been pulled down to single digits in the recent, uh, most recent update, as well as China hovering that 6% growth rate. But keep in mind, China did not fall uh, nearly as, as much as the market did last year in the rest of the world. From a U.S. perspective, uh, we saw the, the weakness last month, a 14.5 million unit selling rate. Uh, certainly expected to see things weak, a little bit weaker than, than our expectations going into the month. And as the month progressed, we were looking for around a 15 million unit selling rate. So it's definitely pulling back. Uh, that has caused over the last couple of months a reversal in the forecast as well. We started really edging up. Uh, we were right around a 17 million unit uh, rate for the year. Uh, and then obviously we ran out of vehicles. Uh, so we're sitting at extremely low inventory. We're sitting at record high pricing. Uh, this is through June, but pricing is over $40,000 uh, across the industry on average. And you have a massive pullback in incentives as well. So that magnifies that pricing increase. The only thing holding uh, the consumer, uh, at least to manage that monthly payment in, in a favorable way is really trade-in values. And if anyone has a lease vehicle, you know you've been called by, uh, by uh, the leasing company, by the dealership, by the OEM. They all want your vehicles back, uh, and they promise to give you one. Um, you might have to wait for it, but they, they do promise to give you one. Uh, but anyway, um, transaction, or excuse me, trading values are up uh, over $2,000 on average from a year ago. It's a 63% increase. Uh, so we're seeing almost $6,000 on average increase in trade-in value. So if you've got a vehicle to, to send back and you don't need another one, it's a good time to do that. Okay, on to chips. Uh, so I think when you look at things globally, what we've done here is we've indexed our, our outlook. And the black line is our, our production forecast indexed to 2019 back in January. So essentially when this was starting, but right before it started. And then if we compare that to our, our most recent forecast, you can see what's changed. So I think if you look at 2021, um, we have definitely uh, seen a shift, uh, a movement in the quarter to quarter uh, decline. So from, again, from a perspective of comparing it to 2019, we're down double digits both first and second quarter. 2019, by the way, was something that was a little bit more normal from a volume perspective, which is why we did that. Um, but we've pulled that negative volume into the third quarter now, and also we've pulled down the, uh, the recovery in the fourth quarter. So I think there's still some risk in the, in the fourth quarter, uh, certainly as, as we see the volumes and the, uh, the plants coming up and going back down. I think that's going to be with us well into next year, uh, not on a widespread basis, but I think on a, on a, a limited basis. 
In the next year though, we have uh, shifted out the recovery as well, so we do uh, certainly expect a boost in the first half of the year, uh, but that's been tempered down somewhat. It's in low single digits, second half of the year a little bit stronger. So again, I think that normality is, is probably not gonna be with us for a while. Um, you can see the vine that we pulled out. It's actually th a little over three million units in the first half of this year. First half of next year, we've added back about 750,000 units, so again, moving that, that volume recovery and that inventory rebuild uh, into next year. Here's what the breakdown looks like, um, and this is uh, as of yesterday, so unless there's been more announcements today, which is entirely possible, this is about where we're at right now. So we're, we're sitting at, uh, for the year, taking out about 3.7 million units uh, from our, our pre-chip shortage forecast, so this is what the volume declines look like. And these are declines that we have actually uh, attributed specifically to the semiconductor shortage, not other things like uh, re restrictions and lower demand in some parts of the world. Um, so what does that mean as we, as we look forward? You know, we're obviously through the first half of the year, so the second half of the year we've taken a million units out of the third quarter, uh, and we've taken about t almost 250,000 units out of the recovery in the fourth quarter. So, Again, it's very fluid, but overall, this does not bode well for the demand picture in the second half of, uh, of the year here in the U.S. as well as uh, other parts of the world. When we focus on North America and look at where that volume has come out of, um, the main focus or the main uh, contributors of that has certainly been the, uh, the F-150. Not picking on anybody here, but, uh, but Ford has uh, really accounted for a good portion of the decline in North America. GM is quickly catching up though. Uh, the last announcements, uh, we've seen an increase in, in the downtime and, and the impact, and Stellantis is, uh, is in third there. So moving, shifting out of chips uh, into the longer term picture, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what's changed. So I'm focusing on what's changed in our outlook. Uh, and the EV picture has changed. This is gonna focus on the regulatory environment here. Um, when we look at the elements around the world, so the new CO2 targets uh, in Europe, uh, they came in around a 55% reduction. We were targeting a 50% reduction, so we were pretty close to expectations coming into that, uh, but that is changing as well. The China Roadmap 2.0, uh, essentially the new energy vehicles are to account for 50% of the volume by 2030. Five and after that, uh, ICs are, are expected to be uh, to be done in China, uh, and then of course the the changes in the U.S. plan, which we we heard uh, some of that today with the the uh, the voluntary um, uh, target essentially of 50 percent by 2030 of EVs, uh, so battery electric plug-ins and and uh, fuel cell vehicles. So. All of that has been somewhat baked into our forecast leading into today. Um, we've made some changes to that, so we've increased, if you look at the midterm forecast, we've increased that by about 50%. We've increased the long-term forecast by about 60, 65%, and that gets us to about 35 million units of, of uh, pure, uh, essentially of BEV, as well as uh, plug-in vehicles uh, out by 2030. Uh, what's driving that in addition to the regs is coming from the OEM side, it's certainly going to be the number of models. So you can see the, the exponential model growth here, and this is another, uh, another slide that's been a ticker uh, as, as more and more gets added to the forecast, especially when we look that far out. Uh, so you're looking at uh, probably 650 vehicles by the, by the 2030 range globally, so uh, certainly a big push from an EV standpoint. And then to wrap things up regionally, when you break out the regional differences and the details, uh, the, the U.S. is certainly playing catch up, but it's getting closer, uh, certainly with this new target. Uh, so you have China, which has been there first uh, from an overall standpoint of EV growth. It's been a little bit of an ebb and flow with their activity and their, their, their governmental uh, responses. Uh, but right now we believe that if you look at that and look at the two-stage dual credits, um, that provides a growth really to the range that we're expecting there over, over 35%. You see Europe um, goes past that from a regulatory standpoint and then the U.S. And so right here, if we look at BEVs, the U.S. is coming in at uh, around 24% uh, by 2030. Yes, that's below what we heard today. Uh, if we bring in the plugins, you're right around, plugins in, in fuel cells, you're right around 30% from our perspective. Uh, we think between 30 and 35% is, is the reality uh, when, we, uh, when we look and take into account what we know about infrastructure growth, uh, battery technology, 
uh, consumer acceptance and response, pricing, all of that uh, in this time frame. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up and turn it over to Stephanie. Thank you very much. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so we're going to talk about pandemic disruptions in the EV momentum. Uh, touch a little bit on our forecast as well uh, as we will look through today. Uh, our production and sales forecast, obviously, we know what's going on with the chip cycle and <clears throat> the difficulties that we're going to have for this year, we're seeing a drop this year. But I think what's interesting, too, in our forecast is we really aren't coming back to a production level close to 2018 until 2024 on a global level. Uh, between the pandemic, between the chip shortage, between ongoing things that we haven't even figured out yet, um, there was a big enough dip. It's going to take a while to recover on that. Um, and North America is seeing something similar in that space as well. In 2022, we also have GM expanding some pickup truck production, and we have um, Toyota Mazda plant coming up. So 2022, we see a little bit of an uptick um, for North America. At the end of the month, we were at 22 days supply at the end of July, which is uh, even worse than it was a month before. So that's one of the problems. I think with the semiconductor issue, though, um, there's not a lot of opportunity to, to recover that volume. It's, it's just kind of gone. So even when we get pr pr production more normalized, we're still seeing um, a one and a half million unit inventory shortage, and, and it's going to take a long time for that to filter through. Um, global sales, you know, it's obviously it's still the same two things that are impacting, you know, production is we've got the chip shortage, we've got other shortages happening, and the race between vaccines and variants and how things are going. If you even look at the New York show being canceled this week, we are still in a state of, of confusion about a lot of things, and it's not very stable yet. Um, but we do overall kind of think that in the next 12 to 18 months, we will start to move out of some of this uncertainty stage and, and get back to a little bit of normal. But again, on our global perspective, we really aren't seeing us come back to, to where we were for a couple more years. Um, same thing with the U.S. And we know June and, and Q3 sales are going to be dented by inventory constraint. Um, and even, on, you know, we look at the, the um, financial results that have been coming out the last couple of weeks and to, to Jeff's point about um, the ATPs. The automakers have done a good job of trying, making sure they're still profitable in this. They're, they're managing it as well as they can. Um, it's not easy and it's difficult. But I feel like when we look at the semiconductor issue, it's unlike um, some of the economic issues that, that have had with the recession. It's something that automakers understand and suppliers understand what, how to deal with. It's hard to find those extra solutions. It's hard to move things around and what can you build differently and maybe you use this part differently. But at least supply chain challenges are something you've all been working with before and there's processes and it's, it's not easy, but at least it's, it's in the realm of what you understand, unlike just shutting production down for two months because of trying to control the pandemic. EVs, if not, it's when and not if at this point. Um, the announcement today certainly leads to that um, or contributes to that because the U.S. Is, is now really on board. And in getting um, the automakers to agree to this voluntary, it really is right in alignment with what they were saying already. Um, if you listen to any of their, their statements over the last couple of months, this is the direction they were going to head. And, and I think if they can agree to this, it might stave off some, some hard regulation, at least for the U.S. Um, but our electrification framework sort of assumed that a lot of this was going to happen. And really on the other side, you see a lot of green in those areas for BEVs. Um, and a lot of opportunity for them to, to improve over time. Our forecast now, this is from a couple of days ago. Um, we had expected the EPA announcement that we're still waiting for, but we expected them to, to go towards the California framework. We expected that between whether some sort of voluntary agreement or the, the issues going on with California and the other states to, to get to that space was was kind of on the horizon. We're looking at 32% BEVs in 2030, but you add some PHEVs in there, about 6%, and it builds it up. I think what's interesting, too, is that we're looking at, at that 2031, 2020, 2033 timeframe of maybe even seeing our, our BEVs outsell the ICEs in the United States. Even if it's not 50% or 100%, you still, that's where you're seeing your, your change. And leading up to that, the nameplate count that we were talking about, um, the ICEs, are, are they're going to change. 
and we're going to start pulling out ICs out of the out of circulation. And whether it's <laughs> using the name on a different model or whether it's a new name, some of these ICE models are going to have to go away as this changes. Over the years, we've had um, we've looked at this framework quite a few times, and, and they still it still plays. These are the seven things that we really think need to have happen. Um, to varying degrees and, and different markets will apply them in different ways in order to make EV sales expansion happen. A lot of them are moving forward. We're going to talk about a little bit of that. I think one of the important things here too is um, the U.S. or not just U.S. automakers have a lot of inertia. The industry doesn't, doesn't move very quickly. In the last six months it's moving a lot. With all of the investments that have been announced in the space, we're, it's, it's shifting, and it's now it's shifting quickly. And now that we're off and, and, and running, things can happen a lot more quickly. When we look at consumer vehicle cost, fuel price, and driving range, cost and price is getting better. Right now, they are still in that 40, the least expensive will be in that $40,000 range, but at least it's getting better, and you're in that space. Driving range is really at a point where consumers can work with it. The difficulty and the concern with consumers is more about charging time and that interaction together. Um, but EVs are still more expensive than the similarly cost sized vehicles, so we still have some, some things to work through on the cost side, but it's still getting better. Regulations and infrastructure and charging. Regulations is really, it's the hammer. It's, it's, it's making this happen. The um, U.S. is following China and Europe. Um, and automakers are investing as much because they have to compete there as they're competing here, and you, you've got to start spending some money. I think two years ago I was here and we were talking about the idea of, of automakers being pressured to, to fill all these capital intensive needs, and whether we saw some sales stagnating in 2019 before we were going into 2020, we expected a little bit of stabilization in there. Um, and so revenue wasn't going to necessarily be as high. Now we're standing here in 2021, and, and most automakers have clearly made the decision. We're not going to continue to support ICE and, and um, BEV. We're just going to go to electrification. Um, and that's a, a fun, partially a function of regulation. Infrastructure and charging is getting better and better. Um, I, obviously, President Biden's statement this morning, part of that is uh, the idea of a national charging network. And I think that's an important one, um, partially because of the things that I say are, are, are problematic in the charging infrastructure. Right now you can drive down the street and the gas station has big huge signs that says exactly how much you're going to pay for, for a gallon of gas. At this point, charging stations are still hard to find. You don't know exactly what you're going to pay for it. Is it one where the landlord of the building charges? you know, for you for using it? Is it just the electricity? Is it a, you know, is it in your network? And there's a lot of confusion and there's no transparency and they're very difficult to find. And if we start looking at a national structure and a national charging network, maybe we can address some of those things and that can make consumers feel much better about what do I do if I need some charge. Um, R&D and, and the battery supply chain, <coughs> sorry, I'm um, not going to go super deep into this because we kind of all know it, right? I, I feel like the last couple of months was just a contest to see who could say they're investing more, and, and Daimler won at $47 billion through 2030, so, you know, they're biggest, biggest, uh, biggest pile of cash so far right now. But that's happening, and it's including the battery cell development. I think Alan's going to talk about some of the challenges <laughs> in there. It's not simple. It's not resolved. It's still going to take a lot of time to develop battery production. We still have some, some raw material issues to work through. But the money is now there. Like I said, the focus is, is changed. And automakers are saying, this is where we're going to go. This is where we're going to put the money. So that then changes a little bit more from a challenge to the momentum side of the, ch of the change. Other things we're seeing is consumer attitudes are cha changing just a little bit. Even in the U.S., calendar year to date, May 31, EVs got another 4% of share. Um, PHEVs picked up a bit, which I've been watching those and they hadn't been moving. Um, HEVs got to 5.8, which is one of the highest market shares HEVs have had. It was also interesting because we've had them for 20 years. Um, and consumers really didn't, haven't put, pulled it that much into their wheelhouse. The product and choice that Jeff talked about. Um, it's not just the number, it's the fact that now they're in, EU, in SUVs, now they're in the products that work with people's lives that people want to buy. That's going to make a huge difference to, to whether or not they accept them. Uh, 
Um, in the short term though, when we have all these, these new EV nameplates, it's going to be tight. Low volume per nameplate, low volume kind of in some of these platforms because there's still that competition. When you get further out, we should see that um, normalize. <coughs> Another challenge in here, um, consumers <coughs> accessibility and education are, and, and education of EVs and charging networks and what can you can, what can you really expect? What does it really mean to change your life in this way? And those things I think a lot of consumers don't really understand exactly how it's going to work and they're nervous about it and it's hard, it's hard to explain. I mean 800 volt battery or 400 volt battery, DC fast charging isn't always the same thing at a different charger. It depends on, <laughs> on how much that electricity is really coming through. It's hard for them to understand. When we look at, at funding here and the income demographic, I pulled this out. Um, when you look at sort of where all powertrains are in the, in the darker green, the income distribution is, is across the map. But if you look at the EVs and the HEVs, they're higher up. And whether that is through vehicle cost, vehicle cost coming down so then they can charge less or can start using batteries in cheaper vehicles or it's incentives, something has got to change. We've got to see that, that break out a little bit more. VIO data, <coughs> real quick interesting thing here. Um, we looked at that and, and over the last 10 years, the, the electric vehicle owners are keeping them longer. Gasoline vehicles are getting rid of them faster. Gasoline vehicles owners are staying with gasoline. 63% of EV owners return to, to EVs, which sounds really great, except there's 30% who went away. And if we're going to try and get to some of these numbers, that's going to be a thing. Um, percent of VIO and the, in the sales side like to see the EVs change hands a little bit more. And sustainability, we'd like to see the EVs be around a little bit longer. This is 2010, there were two, I'm sorry, 2011 to 2020, 95% of the gasoline engine vehicles are still on the road, 91% of the electric vehicles. What's next? Very quickly, wrap this up. So we, regulations are driving the transmissions, transition, excuse me. Um, new product competition though for EV is ICE. It's, this isn't about going after Tesla or going after that. This is how do you convince a consumer to give up your ICE for an EV or your EV, your ICE for an EV. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for automakers now that the inertia is overcome, now that the bear is woken up, now that it's spending money in there, it has scale, it has ability to innovate, it has ability to move quickly when it wants to. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for OEMs in this space. And with that, I'll turn it over to Colin. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to be back in person. Uh, particularly, I live in Manhattan, so I'm a little tired of doing meetings and having to hide my bedroom from my bedroom slash office. So uh, today, I'll be talking about the Wall Street perspective on the outlook. And I spend a little bit uh, of time on U.S. auto sales, but most of my presentation is actually going to uh, talk about BEV and autonomy. Uh, and then I'll wrap it up and try to talk about, you know, how this is going to impact the suppliers since that's the majority of the audience here today. So one, just quickly on my U.S. sales outlook, uh, it's sort of this is welcome to a uh, very unique supply-driven auto world, something in my over decade of covering the spec sector I haven't seen. We basically have one month's uh, supply of inventory in the industry, which uh, basically means once they're hitting the dealers, they're moving off the lot. So the traditional forecast measures are thrown out the window. Um, I think, you know, it's interesting is that the U.S. are worse, but everybody is lean. I mean, there's not one automaker with lean inventory, and even all the key products are lean. So this is really across the board, and as was mentioned by Jeff, I mean, the silver lining here is, you know, record pricing that we've never seen before, um, and that's been driving really, really good results from the automakers, uh, despite you know what's really, really low volumes. Um, but in sort of my way of now looking at auto demand is really looking at, you know the semi issue. And so this chart really is a timeline of you know what really got us in this situation. And so in Q2 of last year, like most recessions, auto companies cut their orders pretty significantly. What I think was unlike prior recessions is we saw a surge in demand from PCs and telecommunications equipment, and the automakers had no idea that it took six months to order their semis. Uh, usually that wasn't an issue. 
And so those orders cut the line and it was really wasn't until the end of last year when production surged back in a record way that everyone realized we're out of chips. That was bad enough until earlier this year we had the Texas storms, no one really talks about this, but two plants were put offline on the semi side there. And then obviously it's been pretty well publicized in the auto space, but the Renaissance fire obviously delayed things as well. Um, so, you know, I spent a lot of time now talking to the analyst at Wells that covers uh, semis. Um, the good news is it seems like relief is on its way, but this is really going to be a crawl out here. Um, we really are looking at probably to the middle of 2022. And, you know, with a lot of companies reporting over the last few days, we're, we're really seeing that in numbers. The second half is definitely looking a lot weaker, and the semi issue is, is clearly still squeezing things pretty significantly. My forecast is a 16.2 USR for this year, which is a pretty significant drop in the second half, largely because of this supply issue. So, with that, I'll shift to, to battery electric vehicles and my outlook there. And I really think there's like three core drivers here at a very basic level. There's the consumer, there's government, uh, but I'll spend most of my time talking about the cost outlook. And so this slide looks at, you know, if I were to talk to my battery experts at the end of last year, um, they would have said battery costs at a NMC, which is sort of the nickel base that's standard among most traditional automakers, was trending about $105 per kilowatt hour, which seemed to be a very good level. By 2025, they see a pretty good curve to get that down to about $75 per kilowatt hour at the cell level. And then with a lot of shots on goal here for solid state chemistries, we could get that possibly below $60 if those work by the end of the decade. So there is a great curve. If you look at the cell add 2000 ish for the pack, you're talking about a $2,000, a little bit more difference between um, an internal combustion engine and a battery electric vehicle. Unfortunately, and that is kind of the way people quote it in terms of dollars per kilowatt hour, uh, they unfortunately typically leave out the uh, e-powertrain costs. So if you look at the diagram, there's numerous components of the e-powertrain that's, you know, $3,500 additional content. And so that gap is now about $5,700 over an internal combustion engine. And then, unfortunately, as I started off, I said it was end of last year. And just like every single commodity cost out there, all the battery costs are through the roof, nickel, cobalt, lithium. Um, no one's talking about this, and I think given all of the very positive press that uh, battery electric vehicles have gotten this year, it's a little surprising that we just had a, about a $1,900 per vehicle step back because of that raw material cost headwind, we're probably now instead of 105 at about $140 per kilowatt hour. Um, that's a, a big challenge going forward and really, you know, one, and so you add that up, that's, you know, $7,700 more. So there's a, there's a big cost disparity today. You know, that said, I think, you know, we can get to parity still. Most of the battery experts think this raw material inflection is, is driven by a sudden spike in demand and we should see some normalization like we might see in other commodities. Um, but it, you know, even if we get to that $75, it's still going to be probably end of decade that we get upfront cost parity and then you take total cost of ownership. The biggest cost of the vehicle is actually buying the car. So unless there's some sub subsidies up front on the EV cost, um, it's going it's, to, it's actually only be a couple more years forward for getting the total cost of ownership probably maybe, maybe mid-decade. I think the biggest challenge and I think at this point, you know, government is really critical and I think that's why we're seeing a lot of automakers sort of push aggressively because they're seeing around the, the world that, that support. Um, but there's really three key needs here. One, as I highlighted in my cost analysis, there needs to be some bridge funding uh, in terms of credits to get people into these electric vehicles because people say they want an EV but you ask them if they'll pay a premium, many people won't and that's going to be a big issue for automaker profits. Two, we need funding for the charging network, uh, particularly as we get these to more scale. We're going to need a lot more chargers to handle those sort of heavy, you know, Thanksgiving weekend type levels when everyone will be traveling. Um, that is actually part and still in the proposed U.S. infrastructure bill, so that, that help might be coming in the U.S. And then the third point, which I think is the least talked about, is, you know, people announce mega battery factories and that's all well and good. We don't have the raw material processing capability for the lithium 
you know, and the graphite that is needed. And it's very sensitive, these batteries, to the quality of that material. So we could mine lithium here, but today most of that would need to be shipped to China anyway to get processed and then shipped back. So unless we f f fix that issue, we're going to have some issues. And then that parity is not going to occur. So I'm a bit more cautious than most. I have a 22% global forecast for 2030. People are throwing the, the 30 and 40% out there, but we really have to start today to get the supply chain ready. And I, I don't have high confidence that even if demand's there, and if we don't have the supply chain, that, par that raw material cost probably won't come down and the parity will take even longer. With that, I'll switch to autonomous vehicles. And anytime you talk about autonomy, I, I always feel it's important to, to, to highlight what you're talking about. So I'm kind of talking about level four, level five autonomy, not sort of Tesla autopilot or GM Super Cruise level two. I think there'll be huge growth in that area. Um, but there's obviously been a lot of excitement over the last few years about full autonomy, you know, sort of no wheel that you could take a nap in your car and sort of arrive at work. Um, you know, unfortunately, and I think the sentiment is, is getting out there in a larger degree, you know, most experts that I talk to think that it's probably end a decade at best before we see which should be scale autonomy. And scale would be something like a major, a large part of a major city. I think we're going to see a lot of smaller deployments on the way there. Um, but I think until, until we see it where we're kind of giving up our cars, it's going to be a long road to get to that level. That said, the race is a long race. And so the players today are extremely relevant. So most experts also think that top six players are going to contain the ultimate winner in this, if, if there is one. <laughs> and so obviously everyone you know, knows Waymo and Cruise. They've actually received the, the highest valuations from funding. But don't count out the Argos, the Motionals, the Auroras, and Zooks, who was obviously bought by Amazon. Uh, they all have been developing this for a while, and their strategies might prove out over the next decade, uh, considering there's still, a, unfortunately, a long road ahead. Um, uh, the other trend I think is very important in autonomy is delivery. Uh, we're seeing actually, and the slide does show, some of these new startups that are more heavy truck, or one is a smaller form. Um, delivery application. And there's really two reasons why, you know, companies are pivoting to delivery. One, from a technology side, it's actually easier. Uh, the human is, is very messy, so you don't have to worry about that when you're delivering goods. Uh, and two, the human's also pretty impatient. And these cars can be very slow because they follow the laws like no one else does. So, you know, you're going to have an easier technology hurdle to get there from a delivery side. The other point that people don't talk about on autonomy that's very important is the economics are not n nearly as easy as people say on autonomous rideshare. Uh, a lot of people say it's you know going to be 30 cents a mile for autonomous rideshare, and that's 70 cents per per mile for personal car ownership, and therefore you know we're all going to just give up our cars and drive in this, this sort of autonomous world. The math actually doesn't prove out. I mean, the analysis here is largely based on an MIT study. Um, I have yet to been sort of disproved on it. People could question the assumptions, but when you add in things like uh, teleops costs and the utilization is also a factor people don't put in, it's really more like 150, 160. Doesn't mean that we're not going to use full autonomy, doesn't mean people aren't going to pay that premium, but this win-win scenario isn't there. Where when it comes to delivery, you're taking out a delivery driver, and so the economics across the board work. And so I think we're going to see if it really is going to take 10 years to prove out scale autonomy, all of those startups who might need 10 years of funding are going to start moving into delivery. We've already seen that. Waymo has a heavy truck. Aurora has a heavy truck. Uh, Cruz partnered with Walmart. So we're going to see delivery, I think, much sooner, and that's going to be an interesting trend over the next few years, maybe keep a little more excitement on autonomous alive. Uh, with that, I'll pull it together from a supplier perspective. This uh, table looks, this uh, chart really looks at, you know, the next 10 years of where are really the growth areas for more traditional suppliers. And it's a really challenging chart. I mean, there's really only two areas that are growing, you know, one being the electronics, which is that sort of level two ADAS, uh, and then two being the e-powertrain. And both of these aren't really pretty stories. It's a pretty complicated slide because I, I really tried to track down all of the e-powertrain suppliers, and, and there are a lot of them. <laughs> Everyone is running into this space uh, to find seeing the content opportunity, and I really see four risks. One, a lot of automakers are already thinking of insourcing this. Two, as the slide shows, this is just the largest guys. There's a ton, over a dozen in each major component really cha chasing this market. 
And then the last two I think are really important. Um, you know, you're seeing the need for breadth. You know, today you used to have an E motor and an inverter. Many of these are being merged together. So of those expensive subcomponents, many of them are going to be fused together. And if you don't have that breadth of technology capability, you're not going to be able to win the sale. So having that breadth is important, and that's really going to leverage and you know, really help the larger suppliers. The other scale you need is these 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 a lot of these con a lot of these components are going to be used across many different size vehicles. So the scale opportunity is quite large so you also need to be able to handle that global global scale. The story unfortunately isn't much better in electronics. We see almost every major uh, global tier one supplier is already has a dominant position in this space. It's also very challenging because it's not sort of the traditional auto mechanical engineering. It's more software focused. Uh, so it requires a very different skill set. A matter of fact, probably a threat of, you know, tech entrants trying to take a piece of the pie here. Um, so unfortunately it's going to be a bumpy road ahead from my perspective, uh, though I think the industry has been pretty resilient in the past and I remain actually pretty optimistic despite the, the end of the presentation on how the U.S. is going to fare. So with that, I'll, I'll, we'll start the panel. Yeah. Yes, great. Thank you. Well, I was taking notes. Um, as you guys were talking and uh, Jeff, you have LMC at 24% EV, yeah, I can't read the chart exactly, uh, by 2030, IHS 30% by 2030, Colin 16% in North America. Do you want to give us a US number? About the same. Um, so I want to talk about um, what are the um, there's a whole bunch of assumptions that go into that and what the policies are going to be, where the subsidies are going to be. What gets you to 50% by 2030? What needs to happen for your forecast to bump up? What are the supportive policies? What are the market changes? What needs to happen to get to what the president is, is telling us? We're going to have a target of 50. The consumer. The consumer. The consumer has to vote in. I mean, all of this is, all of this is targets. Uh, what we've talked about with the U.S., China and, and, and the EU have more strict regulations that they're putting in play. But even so, you've got to get consumers on board, and that's that's still a big wild card. We can get here and get to this 30 percent by having it out there, um, but consumers need to do that. And, and a lot of the things that we talked about and what they have to overcome, it can be done, but it could be more difficult than than we think too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think behind, absolutely agree. The consumer is is has to buy the vehicle. Um, so you, you can do a couple of things. You can remove ICE, and, ICE vehicles and, and take the choice away. That's an option. Um, but I don't think the industry is ready for that. I don't think the infrastructure is ready for that. So that's a, for me, that's a big roadblock is the infrastructure. If you can't go from point A to point B or point A to point B to C to D to, and so forth without having some sort of anxiety or, and I'm not talking about just range anxiety, but if you actually can't charge your vehicle at the station because it didn't work, uh, or you had to wait two hours for it because there aren't enough charging stations, I think you've got to get that wait time down to something reasonable like a like filling up your vehicle. Maybe not quite that bad, but if you can get it down to five or 10 or 15 minutes even, and you can count on it, um, then I think you, you get the mass consumer over to the space. I think you've also got to educate the consumer on the benefits and, and maybe some of the fun of an EV. Um, the performance elements are there and I think that's why we're seeing some pivoting going on and why with the, you know, with the pickup trucks obviously it's still about um, the zero to 60 is, you know, is an element but it's also the off-road capability, the onboard uh, generators, the other things that they can do. So I, I think it's, it's getting everyone around the idea that there are benefits not just um, not just the environmental element. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not as concerned about the consumer. I actually think the consumer will get there, to be totally honest. I think people are already showing desire. I think, as my presentation talked about, it's the cost, um, you know, because right now we could sell them and automakers will lose tons of money in general. Um, so that's clearly the biggest challenge, and I think it's going to be that sort of deep supply chain to actually physically get there is going to be a challenge. And then when you actually bring up a number like 50%, then you really have to start worrying about, like I live in Manhattan, right? I, I don't have a place to charge a car, so if I wanted one, I would need somewhere to charge regularly. You talk about people who own an EV, you know, they charge at home all the time, so it's mm -hmm. convenient. So the charging is a real challenge because 
it's actually going to be very low utilization other than these like high use weekends. So it's going to be this sort of undesirable business model actually to build out because it's low use only maybe once or twice a year when you have a lot of traffic and taking long trips. Uh, but it needs to be built out for that sort of at least a minimum weight on, on those trips because then people really won't buy them. And, and following that, the, the comment about um, the, the usage of that, the business model for charging stations doesn't seem to be very clear. Um, I, as I understand it, EVgo wants to sort of sell the electricity to fleets. Um, ChargePoint wants to build chargers, and somebody else is actually selling the electricity. They're not really involved. EV Amer e Electrify America, excuse me, I think they're in the business of spending money. Um, <laughs> they need to get enough money out of that to keep it going, but that's not meant to be a for-profit model. So it seems to be very unclear to me exactly who's making money when the vehicle is charged. When you go to a gas station, you know who's making money. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to be a pretty fundamental thing to make this economics work. If nobody's making money on the charging process or somewhere in there, then no one's going to invest in it. Well, and we know who's getting taxed to pay for the roads when you're pumping gas at the gas pump. Um, that's a big challenge, which we're not going to get into um, here. I, when I talk about this, I talk about three uh, parities we need to reach. Cost parity, which you've talked about, Colin, um, and the consumer incentives will help get us to cost parity. Uh, utility parity, which the automakers seem to be doing a great job of giving everybody a choice of the type of vehicle their family will fit into, and then this convenience parity. Um, another factor in convenience, besides the infrastructure, which there are two infrastructure uh, bills going through Congress, maybe, <laughs> we'll see what materializes out of that, is how fast a charge takes. So fast charging is part of that, but battery chemistry and, and what kind of batteries we're looking at um, is an important part of that. Do you want to comment? Uh, yeah, on? and what kind of batteries, and, and uh, you know, the, the, I mentioned the 400 volt or the 800 volt. The, the more electricity that battery can take, the bigger the cord needs to be, for lack of a <laughs> real technical term. And so that means the charging station is more expensive. That means the charging process is more expensive because you're just opening up the floodgates and spending more through there. And again, to the consumer education point, I don't think they really even understand that those are, are issues. You know, they're, they see the ads or they hear the conversation that you can DC fast charge in, in whatever amount of time, but they don't understand the background behind that. And because we don't have a national sort of idea on that, there isn't any consistency, and as we continue to develop electric vehicles and, and they get better and better and we do batteries better and, and everybody tries to do you know, new and more, then some of the charging stations that have been around for a couple of years won't be particularly relevant for vehicles. So it's, that, yeah. I think, is it can slow things down a little bit as well. I mean, I think from a, a technology side, it's really going to be hard to get below 30 minutes without the more you shove into the battery, the, the more it degrades. So it's actually really bad for the battery to, to do supercharging mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, so I think you're going to kind of be stuck at probably around the 30 minutes uh, unless there's some sort of major breakthrough. Mm -hmm. I think people are getting used to it because I think most of the charging for most people, and that's why when you get above 50, then you have people who don't have a place to charge at home. Um, but for most people, are probably going to do it at home. So. Mm -hmm. We talked uh, yesterday about all the great uh, restaurants we've eaten at and gas stations. So I'm wondering <laughs> whether no. um, gas station restaurants become a bigger thing and whether there's you know more utility for, and for sitting around for 30 minutes. Cause there, there may be. And I was talking with, with um, somebody once who said, wait a second, no. But, but once people really get behind EVs and they understand how cool they are, because they are cool, there are, certainly there's nothing wrong with the vehicle that makes it not, not attractive, mm -hmm. um, they won't mind waiting 30 minutes because their car is so awesome. I'm like, oh, mm. that's a theory. I, and yeah. For some people, it'll work, I, I but back on, <laughs> not at 50%. I, I, I push back on, on the notion of these, well, I mean, we have these, they're called oases, you know, in different parts of the country. Um, mm -hmm. And they have so these complexes. And um, I think if you're on a road trip, most likely you want to, and there's different elements. Obviously, if you have kids, you're going to want to stop and stretch your legs and maybe get a, something to eat. Um, but I want to get to where I'm going, and yeah. this isn't. If, if you have put shopping in there, and, or or some other entertainment, um, unless it's something really interesting, uh, that's not going to keep me. So you, I need that fast charge, and and it's yeah. not there yet. And I think on top of that, I think you still have potential for localized or isolated grid issues, uh, especially in potentially in neighborhoods. Um, if everybody installs a charging station and has an EV, and if there's not a mandate on when you can charge at or how you can charge it, then 
Um, you know, I think you still have other issues, um, bottlenecks around that as well. Right. Colin, you talked a bit about scale, and we've got a bunch of suppliers sitting here. I think scale is a really important uh, conversation as we move from uh, you know, all of the parts that go in inter into internal combustion engines, all of our platforms, you know, the average vehicles per platform is, you know, been a steady amount, except for if you're on like the F-150 program, that's kind of a, you know, you're a million units a year. Um, but there's a lot more move in this industry to common parts, uh, to common, uh, you know, the, the uh, powertrain is not a differentiator anymore, really, in an electric vehicle. So, you know, you can have the same motors in your sports car as you have in your delivery truck. Um, so what, does that going, what is that going to mean for our suppliers who are sitting here in the audience, and what, what should they be looking for? Well, I mean, if you have the scale, that means you could get the economies of scale that the automakers are looking for. I think you're seeing the automakers are doing whatever they can to get EVs to their credit, right? They're pushing the technology. They're building the mega factories. They're even talking about changing the sort of sales process to a more direct process, and they're trying to get as much scale. The skateboard design, that's supposed to be the, the huge benefit of it, that you could sell it across so many different vehicles, and that, that, that should benefit the suppliers who get on it. I think the challenge that I highlight in my presentation is, it's a skill set. It's if you go into the components I'm talking about, and I've done a teardown before, you're looking at little mini computers. So it's a very different skill set than the more mechanical components that a lot of suppliers do. I think that's the biggest challenge. But getting on it, if you have global scale, it, it's a it's a great opportunity. Well, something like a, not of employment or of output, but of just the sheer number of auto suppliers in the United States. 70% of them are fewer than 100 employees. When we get into those sub-tiers, and we have some economic developers here too who are working with how to keep their local economy robust, and auto is a big part of that, what, what do we think is going to happen with this ginormous scale wave coming at uh, these very small suppliers? Well, I mean, I think it's, I don't think it's anything new to the industry, right? I mean, yeah. I think I've seen, I haven't seen a recent update on this, but the number of suppliers has been trickling down. So yeah. I think it's going to, and same thing with, same with the dealers, we've seen them sort of consolidate as well. I think mm -hmm. you're going to see continued trends on that front. I think it's a, it's a little challenging for some companies today that, you know, might have to decide that they just don't have the, the capital to invest to make this next pivot. But, you know, um, you know, you run the business economically. And I, I, as my president, my view is I still think there's a pretty long life for the internal combustion engine and maybe just run it for cash and ye mm -hmm. yield the benefits of not having to do a lot of CapEx on whatever you're supplying today. Yeah, I think, I think the scale element, I, I would agree. It's, it, it's, it's here today. Um, so yeah, you have consolidation, you have partnerships, you have leveraging costs that way, you have, mm -hmm. um, I mean, you have the tiers. So I think that, that doesn't go away. I, I think it, it just shifts emphasis and focus. Do you see any geographic shifts, like as we you know, run out the internal combustion engine and transmissions, do you see any of that consolidating, say, in a low-cost country like Mexico? Um, if you're going to run out your you know, engines and transmissions, for the 50% uh, of the market that's not EV, and for service parts, um, there's not a whole lot of investment in new technology here. Do you see it consolidating? I don't know that there's a need to move it. If you think about what needs to go into the, to the battery electric and the transmission, mm -hmm. um, and that's gonna end up being in a different place. So if you're just running it out, the cost of moving it to, to a different location where the labor is a little bit cheaper, it's still gonna cost you to get to that cheaper labor. Mm -hmm. And is it really a, a big benefit of you to, to do that? Um, so it might just sort of stay, <laughs> but. Some, some of it's gonna get edged out as they repurpose yep. some of yep. those powertrain plants yep. for e-transaxles and e Some yeah. of them will, but we yeah. need fewer. I, I, Trans, yeah. e transaxle plants, I think then we do transmission. So there's the balance in there as well. Right. I mean, I, I could see some of that going to low cost, um, it, especially if, if you see a massive shift towards electrification and you're left with a technology, an, an, um, you know, ICE technology that's not being advanced any further, um, almost to the extent of like service parts now on vehicles that aren't built anymore. Um, you know, th those, are, those are done in low cost elements uh, so that you can keep keep the cost down and there's nothing that's going to necessarily change or it's not going to change significantly. So I think you, you can keep quality and, and um, consistency in a, in a situation like that in a low cost country. 
And I think from the automaker side, you're seeing them already try to repurpose the facilities they have, which makes sense. Uh, they have workers, they're trying to utilize them. I think that's why there's a big push to insourcing, particularly when I'm not sure in 10 years it'll be a differentiator on the powertrain. Mm -hmm. I do think there is, as those subcomponents look like computers, a lot of them are electronics. And unfortunately, most of auto electronics is in Mexico. So yep. I do think a lot of that stuff, just by the nature of what it is, will we'll end up there. So I, it's probably a risk at that level. So I know um, everyone's probably sick of hearing about chips um, by the end of two days of talking about that in just about every session. But COVID is still impacting our production, our supply chains. So we've talked about it um, internally at CAR. Like if it weren't chips in the headlines, what would be the disruptor that's holding back production in the US and North America now? One of my uh, questions that came in from the audience is, is it labor? Is it, is it workforce? Um, I know we've heard things about steel, and steel prices are very high, but what would be our limiter on production if we didn't have the chip crisis right now? I, I think it's all of that, actually. I think labor is a big piece of it. Um, I think we're still, we're still going to experience disruptions. We're seeing it in Asia now in some of the factories across, uh, especially Southeast Asia, with you know, with, with the increase of the, of the variance and, and the impact of, of uh, manufacturing. So we've, we've, we've watched plants go down because of that, not just because of chips. I think it's intertwined right now, but I think um, material costs, the other shortages of parts, labor, I, I think we're sitting in a situation where we're short of everything right now. And I think if it wasn't chips that we'd be talking about, and that's having the largest um, component of this disruption, but I think there would be a disruption otherwise. And we, we shut everything down for two months and turned it back on. It's not an easy thing to do. And, and nobody knew exactly where the problems were going to be, but it, you know, you're going to have problems. And we're still going to, so I think I, I agree that it's going to come from a bunch of different ways. And I think another thing that's interesting about it too is the semiconductor issue has impacted almost everyone, but not equally. So when you look at some other things that might come up, whether it's labor, whether it's a resin, whether it's a, another component that we haven't really aren't, isn't on the radar, it's not going to necessarily affect every automaker exactly the same. Um, but a, several of those can pull the whole industry back and slow it down. And it's really, it's interesting to see consumer man, demand stay really high at this point, too. I don't know if it's half it's because they're told that, that there's not very many and they better rush out there. Um, but it, you know, we still have a t another 12 to 18 months to sort of let this settle back down. When you shut the world down for yeah. two months, it doesn't get back, uh, back up together very easily. Right. We just have a couple minutes left here, and I want to do one quick last round through everyone. Um, every time we have a big disruption, the tsunami in Japan, the floods in Thailand, the COVID, um, we learn something. So what do you think is the biggest lesson of the past, I don't know, however many months we've been doing this, um, that we, um, we need to take caring forward through, for this industry? What's the biggest learning that the industry needs to, to carry forward? Biggest learn, um, I, I would say it has to do with the supply chain. I, I think understanding the supply chain and exactly where the parts are coming from and what the shortages potentially are, where the risk is. Uh, you know, we, we saw this from your examples that you mentioned. It was all supply chain related issues. And again, it's mm -hmm. not the supply chain's fault, but it, but if you look at that and just lack of visibility and transparency, I think that's the biggest issue right now. Well, and that's a huge thing. I know the White House has asked for transparency. They were asking all the automakers and big suppliers, we need greater transparency into your supply chain. We don't have it. Um, and, and I think that what we've seen the industry back, react to, um, I think supply chain and, and managing that a little, managing that better um, is a relevant point, but we, we've, we just keep learning how to do that better. That, that keeps going. The, like you said, the examples that you mentioned before, automakers changed how they were doing things. You know, Ford was talking in their earnings call about things that they're changing from what they've learned from the semiconductor. So that constant change and that constant evolution is part of it. Mm -hmm. But I think that maybe the auto industry is learning how to behave a little bit more quickly than it has before, whether it's figuring out how to deal with the semiconductor in a different way than they've dealt with other supply chain issues, or it's dealing with online sales, or it's dealing with you know pivoting to this or that or the other thing. I think the automakers are starting to act a little bit more quickly, and maybe that's one of the things that they'll learn from here, and that, that could be a, a good thing, too. Okay. So transparency, speed, 
What's your word? I mean, I think at the end of the day, you're going to see the auto companies all do buffer stocks a semi, and I don't think there's going to be much of a difference, to be totally honest. I think the one that's going to stick the longest is the, the change to the dealer and the actual inventory on lots. I think there has been a surprise how much people are willing to pay for cars, how many people are willing to buy them online, how that's positive because they actually get better pricing because there's less haggling when you buy it online. So I think over the next decade, we're going to see a bigger pivot to online sales, leaner inventory, uh, pre-ordering of customers. Um, and I think that's probably what will stick from this crisis. So retail channels. So, okay, we've got transparency, speed, new retail channels. Great. I think that wraps us all up. Thank you very much for being with us. And uh, I hope you can stick around for our last session of Car MBS 2021.